Right, now we're recording. Hello everyone and welcome to day five of Cambridge Data Week. I'm Lauren Cadwallader. I will be chairing today's session. Uh, before we start, there's just a few uh, things to make you aware of. Uh, please use the chat box to uh, post any questions to the speaker or have any conversation and dialogue between yourselves. There is a word cloud we'll be using, uh, which will come up shortly after we've introduced ourselves as speakers. So uh, there's a link to that in the chat box. If you haven't done so already, please click on the link, enter a couple of words uh, to help us build the word cloud to help start the conversations around data week. Uh, please make sure that you're muted to avoid any echoes or kind of sound disruptions. And we will be running today's session for one hour, so kind of 12 p.m. Uh, GMT time. So uh, without further ado, I'll introduce myself. I am Lauren Cadwallader, the Open Research Manager at PLOS. Um, I started there only two months ago, or two and a half months ago, uh, and I'm responsible for looking at kind of products and services uh, and policies around furthering the open science mission of PLOS. Before that, I was uh, managing the research data management facility at Cambridge University. So working with the wonderful Cambridge University Library who are hosting this webinar today. So I will possibly be kind of talking about both sides of my professional life there. Today, joining me are Kira McNeese and Stephen Eglin, and I will let them introduce themselves. So uh, Kira, would you like to go first? All right, hi everyone, my name's Kira. Uh, I work at Cambridge University Press in the role of research data manager. Um, and essentially I'm responsible for all of our strategy and policy around supporting open data in the open research sense. Um, looking at some of our journal policies, what our journals are doing in terms of peer review of data, among other things, and all sorts of other bits and pieces. I'm generally just interested in open research as a whole, so. Great, thank you, and Stephen. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Lauren. So I'm in the Department of Applied Mathematics and <clears throat> here in Cambridge. I have a long-standing interest in open access, uh, open research, and effectively open data as part of that. I <clears throat> have to declare an interest. I'm a senior editor at Scientific Data, one of the journals that is effectively doing, uh, uh, doing sharing and peer review of data resources. And um, I sort of like to encourage everybody to uh, try and take this topic more seriously. So if I can help in that uh, venture today, then I'm, I'll be happy. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stephen. So I think we're going to start off um, having a look at the, the word cloud that uh, we've asked you to generate to really help kick off our conversation around why data should be reviewed. So we've asked uh, why it's important to peer review data sets. So we've got various um, answers coming up and there's still time to add your, add your words. So please feel free to click on the link in the chat box and add your thoughts about why it's important to peer review data sets. So we can see that integrity, quality uh, are kind of top, top reasons to peer review data sets. See how we go. Reproducibility is coming up the ranks. I'll just leave it for a few more seconds. It's great to see all these thoughts and ideas coming through. So I think that we're getting themes that are coming out of why we should be peer reviewing these data sets around integrity, reproducibility, trust, making sure that the, those data sets that are sitting alongside usually published research articles are really kind of quality in the quality research that we can trust and have faith in and that can be hopefully reused uh, and that kind of leads to more quality and, and uh, well, well researched, well evidenced research. I think it's interesting to think about why data sets are important to peer review from, from a number of different reasons. And I think it's useful kind of looking at this word cloud to think about why it's important to peer data, data sets, um, peer review data sets from different perspectives. So I think a lot of these are from the perspective of potentially a reader or another reuser of those data sets, but also there are uh, interesting um, reasons to think about from other viewpoints, such as authors or publishers. So I think, Bea, if you could stop sharing now. And I'd like to kick off the discussion with Stephen and Kira to think about really uh, 
why it's important to peer review data from those different perspectives. So I think the word cloud um, is showing us that as I think readers probably, it's very important to know that the data is trustworthy, that it can be reproduced, that it's quality, um, that it's quality work. And I was just wondering, how do you think um, that relates to the reasons why it's important for authors to have their data that's peer reviewed? Or indeed why it's important for publishers to make sure that data is peer reviewed? Um, well, I think uh, to speak to that from a publisher perspective, I mean, a lot of those words are about ensuring that we're publishing good science, right? Making sure the data is transparent, there's integrity, and publishers, of course, have a strong interest in making sure that what we publish is good science, because that's what our reputation relies on. That's what we're trying to deliver to the community is reliable scientific publications. So in that sense, um, peer review of data seems would seem to be fundamentally important. Um, I always find that when I talk to friends and family who know nothing about scholarly publishing, they are shocked to hear that data isn't peer reviewed. They're like, what do you mean? You can just write a paper and nobody actually looks at the data behind it. I'm like, that's how the system has worked generally. So yeah, I mean, certainly people outside of scholarly communication, to them, it seems like a no brainer that we should be checking data and we should be checking the information that underlies what people publish in journals. Yeah, and I think with the COVID uh, pandemic, you know, this is just throwing even more into sharp relief, isn't it? That actually we need real trust in in science and research. Stephen, did you have something? Um... Well, I, I I think everything changes when your perspective of what, I, and I'm speaking about science, but it should be more generally about research. But if I if I slip and call it science, it's because of my background. But to date, I think there's still the emphasis that science is based on, the sharing of science is based on sharing research articles. That seems to be the basic premise by which we work. And I think that may have been appropriate 100 years ago or even 20 years ago, but I think we're rapidly moving to the era when we're realizing that the, the valuable bits of research are not just the scientific paper that's produced at the end. It's actually all of the scholarship that goes into the generation of the paper. And data, of course, is a key part of that. And so when you look at it from that perspective, the paper is almost, should be a secondary effect, right? So if you give me somebody's data, I should be able to recreate their paper. But if you give me somebody's paper, there's no way I, 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 there's no way I can recreate the underlying data sets. I'd have to go off and and do it. So we're sharing, we are still sharing the wrong thing. And I think the everything else should follow, I believe, these issues of trust and integrity. If you don't believe a research paper, go, fine, you go and look up the data and you can do your own analysis. We're still not in that era of doing that. We're in this sort of Trumpian world where you can write whatever you like in a paper, and if it sounds sensible, people will believe it and then start quoting it and citing it rather than going to look for ourselves and analyzing the data for ourselves. So I think a lot of issues about trust and openness and integrity should come when people can see for themselves what the data are, rather than having to trust the interpretation of one researcher. So the gold dust is in the data and all of the scholarly efforts of you know curating the data and analyzing the data. And so that's, I think, once we get back to the root of sharing more of that, I hope a lot of these issues that came up about integrity and openness and reproducibility should just fold away because if people are, you know, and I don't, I don't want to get into issues of fraud and stuff like that, right? But that's, that's one obvious side effect. But if people are prepared to share their data, I think it means that they're prepared to stand by their conclusions in their paper. And call me a skeptic, but if somebody isn't prepared to share their data, I have worries about whether they're uh, whether their conclusions are necessarily sound or there are other non-scientific reasons for sharing them. So I think integrity in science will will go up leaps and bounds if we're sharing more data. And it's happening, I think it's fair to say, you know, we should credit where it's happening in, you know, in some areas of science, like in genomics, like we've got the Wellcome Trust Sanger Centre just down the road in Cambridge. The data comes out of the machine and it's online in, you know, in a day or two and it's free for everybody to analyze. That's the kind of world I'd like to move towards. You know, we can't always do that in clinical contexts, but, you know, that's that's what we should be doing. Um, and I think 
that is the fundamental why right it allows other people to reproduce your analysis and and to build on top of it and right now we just can't do that thank you Stephen. they're really interesting thoughts and actually when you're talking about you know flipping the what's the main research output from a paper to a data set and having those kind of being the primary thing I think that's really interesting because it speaks towards this idea of data reuse becoming more and more common and actually if we're putting good data sets out there then, then we reuse them like the, the genomics data it's out there for everyone to look at and that almost starts changing the way that we can fund research because it should cost a lot less if you can reuse other people's research and also that the way that we approach um reusing other people's stuff and it's it's not just for checking the reproducibility but it's actually taking it and building off of it rather than potentially recreating that work and then building off of it absolutely right now i think you know so my field of neuroscience has been particularly bad at sharing and there are always claims for oh well i you know this data set is so bespoke to my needs that nobody else would ever benefit from it I can kind of see that argument, but equally, I think it just means that maybe we're doing some of the science a little bit wrong. And that indeed, if we could just fund, you know, the whole uh, Alexander Freeman here has got this octopus project, which is to effectively break up the scientific workflow into that. So here's a chunk of money to fund this experiment. Your job is to run that experiment and just produce the results. And then it's there for the community to then to, to then build upon. It leads to a much more cooperative view of science, which immediately makes everybody say, yeah, sure, that will never happen because science is too competitive. That's great. Um, I think we probably all agree that peer reviewing of data is a good thing and uh, would help with, with science. Moving on, I just want to get into a bit more of the the what exactly do we mean when we talk about peer reviewing data. Um, I think there are big questions and of course there will be disciplinary differences and subject differences and differences with data types, but in a general sense, um, I think it's good to explore the what do we mean when we're talking about peer reviewing data in terms of qualitative data, quantitative data, do we just mean data, do we mean code? What about physical materials? Now, I don't think we can cover all of these um, points in in the time that we have today. So I suspect uh, it will be easier to focus on the kind of quantitative stuff, the really science-based data, um, but it would be nice if we could make sure we bring in some stuff that's more qualitative based. Um, so just um, it'd be good to get some kind of thoughts on what you think should be peer reviewed as a kind of minimum standard. So uh, I'm going to go to Kira. Do you have um, any kind of broad definitions that you use when you're talking to researchers at CEP? Um, to follow on from the last question, I think it does depend on what the purpose of the peer review of data is. If it's to make sure the data is more reusable, then of course it's making sure that the data itself has got integrity, that it's got good metadata, some, some basic stuff about, you know, is it going to be easily understandable to a third party who goes and accesses that data? Um, when you look at things like uh, reproducibility and transparency of, of a published article, then it gets a bit more complicated because then you look, have to look into all sorts of decisions about how did an author choose to analyze the data? What decisions did they make about which variables or which bits of code they used? Sorry, it's a very quantitative aspect of it. But yeah, so um, I, I don't think that publishing data is going to be the only kind of research output that will matter in the future. I think that those decisions about how data is analyzed are still incredibly important. And having an article clearly lay those out and having a peer review able to check those as well is really important to understanding how someone came to particular conclusions. So just as a couple of things. Um, but yeah, I think it really depends on what the journal's trying to achieve in our case. So in, in some cases, it's literally just making sure people have done some bare, bare minimum data sharing in other cases. We have journals who want to have full replication carried out of the analyses that were performed for the article. And they do actually require the authors to share all of their data, all of their code. And then there's a replication analyst who goes and runs the code on the data again to check that it all works out. So yeah, there are definitely different levels and different layers. And I think it really depends on what you're trying to achieve and for whom. Yeah, which adds a huge amount of complexity on, on, onto this topic and, and I guess issues for publishers to try and work out what the, what the right level is. Stephen, you're nodding away there. Is there anything you wanted to add to, to, to that? 
Um, I certainly agree with a lot of what Kira has said in that, you know, it depends on the context in which it's applied. So the data journals, I think, would require more checks in terms of where is it, where have you put your data? Is it in a sensible repository? Is it marked up appropriately and all this? But at the other end of the spectrum, I think there's this, there's this notion and it, I, I, these views I've sort of adopted from, there was a nice article opinion piece from Nick Barnes in Nature back in 2010, which was titled something like, share your code, it's good enough. And the basic premise was whatever you've got, surely it's better to stick it on a public repository than to just have it disappear on the student's laptop when the student graduates or when the laptop breaks down and then it's gone forever. There's this notion that unless the data are perfectly curated, and in this case, I'm talking about computer code as a sort of an example of data, there's this sort of, there are all these excuses that come back. Well, I'm, I can't share this because, you know, it was just written for me. It's not very clean. And, you know, there's, you know, it needs to run on this kind of system. And you get all of these excuses that come back and just forget those. I think the barrier needs to be incredibly low. You know, as long as it's, you know, once it's in a digital file, we live in the 21st century where we, we are not, we are, are effectively not constrained by data volume. And I say that realistically, I think, you know, you can always talk to people who are generating petabytes of data. Um, you know, but they've probably got their own archive in systems. I don't think storage is the problem. The technical problem, the technical challenges are not a problem. It's the societal challenges. And I think that's really the, the sort of the thing that we've got to get over. So to any researcher out there today, I just say, you know, it's about sharing whatever you've got. And it is a journey because you find that the first time, you know, and I used to write in my papers 10 years ago, data available on request, right? I, I've used that phrase, which now I sort of it makes my blood boil, blood boil. So I think individuals go on a journey <clears throat> as researchers in terms of what, how they choose to share it. But if you, if you wait until you say, it's not been perfectly peer reviewed, I can't share it, you'll never get started. So I think just starting with the lowest possible thing is, is just an easy, easy step forward. Yeah, I think that's a really good point actually. Isn't it? I, I mean, I agree from someone who shared my own data, you know, there's that fear of embarrassment that if you put kind of messy data up there that people think badly of you. And certainly you know, we recently did a poll for computational biology at PLAS asking people, why don't you share your code? And the biggest reason by far was it takes too long to prepare. You know, I, I haven't got the time or the expertise to make it look nice to share. And I think there is definitely a piece around kind of I, I do the culture of sharing or the kind of the way that we perceive sharing as as authors as readers as as publishers I think to me it's a lot like you know when you try and learn a foreign language and you're too afraid to speak it because you might make mistakes but you've just got to actually start doing it because that's how you're going to learn best I think that brings to a really interesting point um, around almost the quality of the data you're putting out there. And if we're thinking about, you know, you want data reviewed because it's of good quality, there's a there's a kind of tension there, I think, between just getting out there and then it being a good quality data. And hopefully the supporting documentation that goes alongside that, that data would, would help um, a reader or reuser understand how it's meant to be used. And so they can ignore those messy bits. But I think it does, um, it does raise interesting points about how that data might be reused in the future. And we do have a question in the chat about kind of the fact that we're now living in a post-truth era. How do we enforce data ethics in this uh, kind of data discourse where we're asking people to reuse and share things? If we're kind of asking them to just put it out there and make sure that it's not perfect, is there a worry that people might uh, take hold of the kind of messiness of this data and, and use it in a way that uh, science is kind of not intended for it to be used? Well, I, I would counter and say, yes, of course, you know, if I, if I stick, if I stick a data set up on, you know, on a resource and I, I don't even, you know, know who's using it, somebody else could interpret that data and write a paper and, you know, maybe I've missed the critical bit of metadata and that describes the conditions under which it was taken, which mean that the other analysis isn't, uh, is, it shouldn't be done. But this already happens, right? 
I mean, it's happening all the time. It's just that we don't see it. The fact that if people are transparent in their papers and they say, well, I used Eglin's data set from over there and this is the analysis that I did, everybody can then see for themselves whether it was appropriate or not. So I think the more openness there is about how analysis of data is performed and reported in papers, the more it allows us to actually check it for ourselves. Rather than right now, it's this sort of, you know, and I think, it, you know, equity of, you know, of data access is important. Till now, there used to be this sort of, uh, I would say, it was this really sort of difficult old boys club where, you know, people, if you knew your collaborator, you could ask them for the data and you'd get primary access to it, but not their competitors or not, you know. And so it sort of reinforces these sort of, uh, these little clubs or cliques of uh, researchers rather than making everything open. So I think eth taking the ethics of this is important. And I don't think you can ever stop anybody misinterpreting data, but that's the same with a paper. You can write a paper and it can be misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. The important thing is, can you, can somebody, when they're, when they're reading somebody's research, can they, do they have the ability to check for themselves? That's, I think that's fundamental. Okay, thank you. Kira, did you have anything Do you want to come on? Um, just to say that to touch on things that are not quantitative, because um, I know we wanted to talk about humanities and social mm. science as well. And I think that, yeah, it, I still think it still comes back to that idea of can you check what someone's research is based on and can you come to the same conclusions? But yeah, in, in the sort of more qualitative research areas and humanities especially, it becomes a lot more difficult to, be, to understand like what that means and what sort of data or qualitative materials you should be sharing. Um, so yeah, I think there's still a lot of discussions to be had in, in those fields or some of those fields about what exactly it makes sense to share and what exactly would be required to reasonably reproduce someone's results or reasonably understand someone's results or build on them. Um, I, I also come from a, a science background, so I don't have a lot of answers in that front, but we're certainly trying to look into that. Talking to some of our humanities and social sciences editorial teams. Great, thank you. I personally come from an archeology span background, so I find this question about sharing uh, your data so it's reproducible and other people can re reuse it quite interesting because there's you I mean you can't excavate another archaeological site again to reproduce someone's work so you are relying on the, the data that's being shared but also that data is being generated in a way that is slightly subjective because I mean I excavate a, a feature and I decide that it's a pit and um, sort of my interpretation becomes almost the data in a way but that, that's a whole different conversation I'll have with other people. Um, I do think though that the disciplinary difference is really interesting and is something worth exploring like how we can tackle that when like academia is, is so large. I mean I know for example PLOS has kind of generic guidelines on how you review a data set that we created with the lovely uh, Cambridge data champions. Um, but that's you know and that's looking at other files there can you open them do you understand what the variables are is there a permanent link and that's great as a kind of basic minimum but i think when we're getting into those different disciplinary uh, reasons for sharing data it it all starts becoming a bit more complicated one example of some work we've been doing at computational biology is having peer review of uh, biology based models just specifically about the models um, and we did that uh, in conjunction with the Center for, let me get their name right, Reproducible Biomedical Modeling, I think it is. Um, but that necessitated, uh, for that we needed uh, a whole separate checklist of, of how these models would be reviewed. And you, if you think about scaling that for all the different types of data that there are in academia, I mean, that's a huge amount of work. So do you think it would be fair to start exploring these kind of peer review avenues for these different data types in the sciences? Um, because that's uh, almost a uh, kind of, I guess, an easier target for those data types and potentially a, a, a crowd that's more on board with this type of peer review. Or do you think that we should be concentrating on kind of all the different disciplines together, and bringing, trying to bring everyone up? Well, I've, um... <clears throat> I mean, we publish a portfolio of about 400 journals, most of which are in humanities and social sciences. And it's definitely been, well, 
it's not possible to look at all the disciplines at once, certainly not for me alone. Um, I think if people are <clears throat> interested in doing that, then it, it really helps if it comes from the community, if there's a community that has a particular interest. I know in political science, there's quite a lot of um, developed practices around data sharing and review of data because there have been issues in the past with mistakes and with fraud. And so the community got together and said, no, we want to do better. And I understand there's been some initiatives like that in archaeology as well, I think. So I think, yeah, engaging with communities who are interested in doing better will be a really good way to do that and sort of working with specific groups who have an interest. Stephen, I'm going to come to you. The code sharing community seem quite um, interested in, in sharing their work. How do you think they feel about the peer review of, of the code? So um, most people are quite open. So co code is a funny beast because yeah, and it, I think if if you're under a certain age, it's more natural to be sharing code than not. So I think there is a nice transformation happening. There is a large growing community of researchers that are putting their code up on GitHub, and then it's it's just there, and it's the the peer review is not a. I think one thing that we sort of traditionally think of peer review is something that happens at the end of the product, right? Whereas when you're developing code you're doing it continuously and you're getting feedback from people and the community. And so that's actually quite nice because it integrates it more naturally into the whole life cycle of the development of the project. So I think there are, there are good examples of, of, of people sharing code pre-publication. There's whole projects that will just work you know, on GitHub and sharing everything from day one. Um, I appreciate that that's not appropriate for everyone and different people choose to share their code at different stages but peer review of code is, can mean lots of different things to lots of different people and uh, Daniel Nust and I have this project called CodeCheck where we try and set the bar really low which is just to say can I run your code on my machine and does it generate something vaguely similar to what you say it would generate, right? So it's not looking, it's not checking, right? A lot of people might think peer review of code is going through and checking every line and saying, oh yeah, that's bug free. Yes, that can corresponds to the paper. That kind of process is incredibly labor intensive. It can take months. We've seen it happen. Uh, if you've witnessed the, uh, the, the Imperial College COVID uh, saga from March in the UK there was a code base that hadn't been seen by the public and fortunately Microsoft and GitHub stepped up and provided engineers that worked tirelessly for about a month to try and review it and iron out bugs and that was then released to the to the public now that kind of resource is just not readily available as a regular peer review activity so I do think we need to start Again, it's to be incremental and just to say, if nothing else, having somebody's code is enough. If it runs, great. And if it generates results that look vaguely similar, then really good. And at the other end, you can go towards the kind of things like CUP or trialing with uh, these kind of uh, uh, working with teams like Code Ocean, where the capsules, they generate capsules of code that effectively can be run by, by anyone on over the web. Um, so there's a whole spectrum of ways in which code can be usefully reviewed. And again, I think it's starting, starting simple. Our experience with CodeCheck has been that there are lots of people who say that they think this is a good thing to do and have volunteered to actually be reviewers. So I think that the way that we can grow this is by working in tandem with particular communities or with particular journals in mind to try and actually build up the CodeCheck and the peer review of code so i do think it i do think it's likely to grow great thank you and in your mind you're saying you you set the, the bar quite low in terms of peer reviewing code at the moment do you do you see that as open science practices progress over the next i don't know decade or so that that bar will gradually be raised as people's kind of practice yeah. I, I i i i i would i would hope that people will gradually start saying hey, this is really useful. Wouldn't it be nice if, you know, you go one step further? And I do think the, you know, for some people, unless everything is fully reproducible, then it's not good enough. I don't support that. I think as long as, so we have a, we have a yardstick, for example, in CoCheck, which is that 
you'll get a certificate which says this code works if one figure or one table can be reproduced. That's all you need to do, not everything. Now, of course, you can see over time where this is going. It could be, well, every figure needs to be reproducible or every table, um, or that it works across different platforms or whatever, right? So you can push the bar up over time. I think if you set it too high, too, high, too early, people are not ready for that conversation and it's not just the researchers it's the it's the funders it's the publishers who you know who's really interested in having everything fully reproducible for everyone everyone i think that's a very niche subject right now but maybe in 30 years it will be the norm but you know i think we do need to work publishers uh funders and researchers together to think about improving reproducibility and uh, the reliability of data in in a very gradual manner yeah yeah i absolutely agree that incremental change and incremental improvements are absolutely key to, to making progress in this great and kira i've got a question around i mean i'm putting you on the spot a bit um the the kind of codation partnership uh with with cup have you found that that's improved uh, the peer review of of code with papers yeah, so what we have with Code Ocean is we one of our journals, Political Analysis, has implemented a workflow where in the past they would ask authors to deposit all of their code and data into Dataverse, and then they had a replication analyst who would go and download all of it and try and get it to run so that he could run the whole replication process. <clears throat> and by switching this to Code Ocean, uh, sort of switch the onus onto the author a bit there because the author has to put all of the code into Code Ocean and make sure it runs in the Code Ocean capsule before they submit it and certainly saved the review process and the replication process a lot of time. Um, yeah, just having that sort of shifting a little bit, which I guess is possibly partly related to our next topic of who is actually doing the work here. Yeah. But yeah, because the Code Ocean capsule is required to have everything actually functioning, it, it does mean that a little bit more work goes into the code rather than just something deposited in Dataverse, which someone will then have to download and then try and create the right environment to be able to run it and check it. So we found that really valuable. Great. So again, it's about lowering the barriers that people face when it comes to to reviewing code in this case, but you know, sharing data, sharing code, that kind of thing. We've got a question in the chat um, around whether we think it'd be useful to share code if, even if you're not allowed to share the data uh, for reasons for, around you know patient data, for example. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I've been doing some interviews with researchers just this week, and actually. You know, some of them have been commenting stuff like, actually, I reuse people's codes because I take it and I run it on the data that I have. So kind of my kind of thoughts around that question we've had in the chat box. So, yes, it's definitely worth sharing code, even if you can't share your data, um, because it can be reused by other people in other situations who may have similar data. Now, that might be because I don't use patient data. and I mean, perhaps there's some really specific variables that that code relates to that might not be transferable. Um, but kind of, I would have thought it's useful to share that code. And even actually, I've heard researchers saying this week that they like code being shared because um, sometimes they just like the figure that's been created off the back of that code and they might want to just know what co color palette they used. So I think there are all, like, all sorts of reasons to be, to be making code available in those situations. I think part of it also comes back to that question of how someone has chosen to carry out an analysis, because there's a lot of information in code, to my understanding, I'm not a coder, um, about you know how someone has chosen to analyze data, not just necessarily what the data set is. And I mean, we've certainly had cases where someone said, not just because the data might be private, but just it's a really, really large data set and it would be really complicated to share it. So they could perhaps share the code and either a representative sample of the data or a dummy data set, or if it's you know a private a private data, they can say, well, we got it from this third party, and you have to go through security checks to access it. But here's how you get the data, and here's our code that we used. So there's definitely value in sharing code, even when the data isn't able to be fully shared. But yeah, just to echo that, I think there's a lot of you know concerns about with clinical data sets, and there are approaches to try and uh, get around this. One of the most uh, important things is always to to be able to check that your your results actually hold up on other data sets and so one of the one of the things that i always advocate is to forget about uh, the real data is to generate uh, surrogate data sets or as kira said dummy data sets 
Because if you can generate your own dummy data sets where you know the structure of what you're generating, it should then show up in the analysis. So it's, a, it's always a very good idea to, sh to generate synthetic data to check that your methods are working before, because you don't know what your real data set should contain, but you do know what the surrogate data set should con contain. So it's always good pr practice in analysis to share that. And then, uh, sorry, is to generate surrogate data sets. And then you've, you've solved the problem because you can share not only your code, but the surrogate data sets. Um, so I don't think there's, there's really an issue there. We should be sharing that code. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on now uh, because of the time to our kind of next big question around peer reviewing data sets, and that's who should be doing the work. I think this is um, quite a big topic, uh, and it's been touched upon in some of the other days. Uh, certainly, I think there is a huge question about actually how can we do this in in the current system. You know, we already hear researchers saying that you know I don't have time to do review, or I'm asked to review, or I have to write a paper for free, and then I have to review it for free, and, and then I have to pay for it to publishing. So there are already kind of inequities in the system around peer review. So uh, I think it's worth having a discussion of actually how do we implement a peer review of, of data in practice. Yeah, I think, um, as we were saying just before the call, like everyone sort of wants someone else to do this. Everyone has a good reason why someone else should be responsible. And I think it is just a fact that a lot of people in, in the research uh, community are just very time poor. Uh, I was reading the uh, latest publication from Research, Informa research Information, published by Europa Science, and they had an article about how since the pandemic and since lockdowns, there's been a significant increase in people depositing data in repositories possibly because people have more time to go back and curate and deposit and publish all of their old data. So I think the time is a big problem and you know, finding the resources to actually carry out the peer review and carry out the curation and publication of data so that it can be reviewed, it is a really big, big question. Um, and yeah, as I said, our work with Code Ocean has allowed us to sort of split that burden a little bit between the authors, making sure they have to make their code reusable and then the replication and lots of you goes and does the replication and reviews it. Um, and I think there may be analogous ways to do that in other repositories where perhaps before you submit your article, you've put your data into a repository that does some fundamental curation. So at least the basic metadata is there. At least we know that it's minimally reusable. Um, and then the data reviewer can just go and check the actual science or the analysis of it, the research aspect of what someone's done with that data. So again, maybe splitting up the burden across different aspects of the process. I think that's a really interesting point, actually, and in kind of putting a bit more onus on the the deposition and the curation and making it more of a partnership, I suppose, between all the different elements of the of the scholarly publishing kind of workflow. It's great, Stephen. Did you have something to say? I probably have too much to say on this topic. <laughs> um, so I and I, I'm just trying to check in the chat. I I can see in the room there's there is vast recognition that peer review is already broken. Right, it's a very difficult subject to try and fix, and everybody has, you know, has important views to share on this. Um, just asking people to do more work and it falling on the sort of a few shoulders is not sustainable, and I do think we need to take this seriously. Um, but I think there's a couple of things to recognise. So one is I would I'd like to briefly mention Plan S, because I think one of the things that Plan S highlighted was this need for if we're having open access papers, there should be some more transparency about what you're paying for in an APC. And one of those, you know, I've had lots of conversations with people about this and, you know, I work with scientific data and in scientific data, the there's a traditional peer review done by academics, but then there's an additional work done in-house to do all of that checks on the meta duration, the curation that we've just, just heard you both talk about. Um, and I think people would be prepared to pay for that as part of an APC if it was clearly highlighted that, you know, this does take time and it could be done by professionals or by, you know, by societies or bodies, but it takes time and it needs to be recognised and it needs to be paid for. And that's exactly what could be factored into an APC, I think, is to say, you know, curation of the data and checking is, is one, of the, one of the steps. And then once you've got money into the system, it can then be, you know, at least done by professionals who know what they're doing and who can then, uh, who can then do a good job of it. 
Um, but I just don't see that happening in Plan S right now. I think we just have to look at this nature debacle this week with their new their new pilot. I see nothing about that, right? And you know, uh, nature in nature, you can still get away with saying data available on request, and you go and request the data, and the authors refuse it. Right? That is just an outrage for this to be happening in 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 journals today. So I do think we need to be doing more to uh, to make sure that the data are properly collected and i think trying to do it through plan s would be important the other thing i'd like to comment on is like in code check one of the things that we're trying to do is we're, we're doing a, sort of effectively a peer review on the code we deliberately have said it shouldn't be anonymous right so with scientific peer review of papers there's this view mostly that you know we should keep it anonymous most of the time and you know gradually that's changing and if you come about from it from the point of view that from day one it's not anonymous that the peer the the person doing the code check knows the author of the original study it then makes things a lot more collaborative this has been our experience is that you can have a conversation the the reviewer can have a conversation with the author and you may say well why would they want to do that well, there are always good selfish reasons to do things. For example, you know, I did the code check of the COVID model. And so I got to talk to the Imperial College team and find out more about their model. And that was really, really insightful. If you hide behind anonymity, the recognition that you might otherwise get for doing the peer review is just is just gone. So with code check, we have all of our code checks. They're, they're up on Zenodo. They're citable objects, so the early career researchers in particular can put them onto their CV to show that they are doing academic service. And so I think we need to highlight the selfish reasons, in a good way, the selfish reasons why which people might want to do peer review of data. And I think that would be to get them, you know, especially for early career researchers, to start having conversations with, with other groups that they don't currently have connections with they can do it in a very collaborative manner because it's not just about saying your rubbish your work is rubbish because you forgot this excel sheet you're just pointing out the obvious oh you know there's a bit of metadata missing the team on the other side will be very grateful and then you, there's a relationship developing so i i think we shouldn't we shouldn't be too negative and i think there are good selfish reasons for which why uh, researchers and i do think the onus is if it's done that way is on researchers to do it myself included as in pass, as opposed to passing the buck but if we are going to pass the buck to the publishers the publishers need to get money to do it Thank you. Yeah. So, Kira, go ahead yeah so i agree with that that um there are definitely incentives for people to contribute to data peer review and we've found with um just regular peer review one of our journals recently uh, found that ha having an open peer review system for a special collection of papers actually incentivized reviewers and they were much happier to do it knowing that they could get credits. And in fact, in some cases, you could have an actual publication of the open peer review report and things like that. So things that can concretely demonstrate that they've been delivering value to the community. Um, uh, what's the other point? Sorry. <laughs> Oh yes, money, <laughs> money for publishers. <laughs> yeah, no, that is a problem we run into. Um, I have several journals who've come to me and said, look, we'd really like to implement a more stringent peer review process, but we don't have any resources to do it. We don't have money to go and pay an institution to do the replication studies. Uh, you know, we don't have that sort of resource. Um, what can we do? So yeah, that's still an open question, I think. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And I think that is one potential big kind of barrier to expanding this peer review is, is resources. Certainly like the, the pilot we've been trialing um, with biology-based models and computational biology has been done in partnership. So, you know, that is a, another organization giving them, giving us their time for free for us to all find out how it works a bit better. And now we have to go away and thinking about sustainability and scalability. So one thing that I think I often hear about increasing um, peer review of, of data is increasing the pool of, of peer reviewers. So really trying to get the early career researchers who wouldn't necessarily be asked to review the paper itself to come on board and review the data. We had a question earlier in the chat about, um, you know, it would be useful to start teaching how to 
present your data or code in a nice tidy way or manage it properly from the beginning so when it comes to sharing it's it's not necessarily messy and I think these two things potentially go hand in hand that if we start getting early career re um, researchers to review data you know it might start helping them think more about how they manage their own data so that when they come to share it's in a nicer state so I like to think that those two things could be complementary but do you think it would be reasonable to start kind of diversifying the the peer review pool by by targeting the early career researchers and what support do you think that they might need um, in order to be able to do the peer review um I I I remember my, my first PhD student came to me one day and she was so excited, um, but equally quite nervous because she'd been asked to do a peer review of a paper. And she showed me the, she showed me the abstract and I said, you are the right person to review this paper, right? And she felt somehow because she was a PhD student, she shouldn't be peer reviewing a paper. And I said, that's nonsense. You're, you know, she was you know, well on her way. And I, I think we don't want to just dump this as an activity that mostly early career researchers will be doing, because I think that's that's just going to be unfair to them, unless there's particular selfish reasons for them to do it. So I do think early career researchers would benefit a lot from the, you know, contacts with these, with these new uh, potential collaborators, effectively, rather than if you say that, you know, you're doing it in a, as a collaborative endeavor, that's important. And I think the sooner that PhD students get, in, get an awareness of what's going on behind the scenes in terms of reviewing. I think that's incredibly useful. So I think, I, I think by starting with data is somehow an easier thing to do than, you know, it's much easier to point out a mistake in a data set. It's, it should be, I think, uncontroversial. Um, whereas pointing out a mistake in somebody's paper can obviously raise a lot of prickles and, you know, I think power relationships there are quite problematic. But with data, I think it should be less, less controversial. And they should be thankful that, you know, before the paper gets published, that these things have been found as opposed to after the paper and having to retract the paper or, or, or rewrite it. They do need training, of course, I think. You know, people don't under you know if people don't understand what you know. The first time I wrote a peer review of a journal, I just spent days and days on it. I wasn't sure what was needed or required. So I do think we need training, but it you know it's it's all doable things, and it's all transferable to their own data sets, as you pointed out, Lauren. Is that once they can do it for other people, they should be doing it for themselves. So I think i would i would i would imagine most journals would relish the chance to enlarge their to enlarge their pool of potential reviewers and <laughs> if we opened up early career research or if early career researchers volunteered for this activity i think it would be met with welcome arms i do think the um yeah the point about trans being transferable skills or transferable um, knowledge is really useful too because i mean if we have more people who are reviewing data and more people who are thinking about how data is shared and should be shared, then we just increase data literacy as a whole across the entire, this entire system, which is going to be good for everyone. It makes it easier for everyone to manage their own data and know how to share it. Great, we've had a question on the chat that goes to a point that you were talking about, Stephen, about the kind of power relationships within peer review. Um, and you said that, you know, you think they're, they're potentially at play during a, during a paper, you know, it's, it feels a lot harder to criticise someone who could, you know, impact your career um, if it's their paper. Do you think that perhaps that kind of uh, potential power relationship exists less in data? Or do you think that, again, that's a societal kind of cultural barrier we have to overcome that people feel comfortable with criticising data? So? I mean, of, of course, there there. If you've got a junior researcher pointing out a mistake to a senior researcher, there is always the problem of a, you know, oh, this is going to come back to me, so I better not say it. But I think with data, we're talking mostly, I mean, I think if we're talking, you know, it kind of depends on the mistake, but if we're talking about bits of metadata being missing or someone be being a bit, bit sloppy with some coding or something like that, I think that should be uncontroversial. Um, but of course, the, the, the junior person should have the full backing of the editor, right? So it shouldn't, you know, if it's done, we do most of our communication in Kocheck, either directly through email. Now, that might not be appropriate 
for this kind of thing if the journal wanted to help with the communication so that at least the editorial team could come in if there were any problems. But from what I've seen, if from day one, it's supposed to be, you know, it's like, hi, I'm here, I'm your friendly data, uh, data checker. I'd like to just sit through your data. If the conversation starts from that point about, I'm here to make sure that your data uh, is of a good form so that we can then share it. It's a very different thing from saying, well, I'm potentially going to block the publication of your paper, right? So I think the conversation is how is how the conversation is had. Um, is is peer review of data supposed to be blocking the publication? Probably not. I think it's about making sure that what is there is more readily shareable. It shouldn't be a a uh, contentious issue. I think where the power relationships come in is, you know, I've seen a mistake in your paper and I think your analysis is completely flawed. I recommend that it's not going to be published, right? That's when I think power power relationships are going to be particularly harmful in, in the peer review process. But I don't think we're talking about that unless I've sort of glossed over it. I think it's fine. I'm going to just move on to Kira um, before we have to start wrapping up. Do you, as publishers, do you ever think about this kind of power relationship when you're inviting uh, reviewers to come and review papers or data sets or anything? Uh, so I've, I've never been an editor personally, so I haven't really been involved in peer review selection, but I, it's I'm definitely something that we're aware of as part of the yeah, scholarly communications general landscape that this is a problem. And we, we have a peer review board at the press that discusses all these sorts of things and making sure that we can approach peer review ethically and make sure that everyone gets supported appropriately. Um, if I can just take a few seconds, actually, there was something I saw in the chat that I wanted to comment on about the idea that reuse itself might be considered a form of peer review. And I think, yes, absolutely, this could be a great thing in that, you know, again, if early career researchers want to go and do a project and try and replicate the results of a bunch of important papers, I, I know that I think there are programs that already do this, right? And then there are many journals these days that accept straight up replication studies validating the original results. So yes, this is something that can happen. This is something people can get credit for. It would be great if more people did it. Um, yeah, I think that is definitely a good idea. Yeah, that, that's, a, I think, a really great point. And I think certainly, uh, you know, what, what I've noticed in publishers, having just moved into a, a, a publishing world from, from a research support, is that, you know, there are all these different types of journal articles out there that publishers are encouraging people to start writing and submitting, and that that that's a good thing we just need to make sure that the adoption happens with, within the community and you know that then starts being to things like research assessment um and what what's valued so i think this is all just what part of one larger kind of scholarly ecosystem that that goes hand in hand together a lot of the times um we've got five minutes until the end of the session uh, and what I'd like to do just before we finish is uh, get you all to fill in a little poll that we've prepared and that's really to ask you as an audience uh, what you uh, which peer review model you might think work and then uh, uh, perhaps we can all give a few final thoughts and comments on it so Bayer if you could launch the poll for me please oh it's in the I see it's in the slack uh, not slack the chat box so it's which peer review model would work best for data. We've, we've given you a limited number of options here to keep things simple, um, but it'd be interesting to, to hear what, what you all think. So you can see the, the votes coming in there. There is some overlap in the answers, I agree, um, with Daniel in the, in the chat there, but, um, you know, I think there are lots of variations to, to how we, we could do peer review. So, I mean, I try to make it simple with these choices. But it's interesting that the, the, the top answer at the moment is incorporating it into the, the review of the existing article. Um, which, is, which is higher than kind of asking reviewers to just look at the data. And I, I suppose we didn't um, talk necessarily about asking the, the reviewers to look at the article and the data so much, but um, do you mean, do you think that that would be a, a workable system? Or, 
or do you think that we should be concentrating more on em employing specialist staff to review the data, which is the second top answer? Do you have any thoughts about where, where CEP might be headed with this, Kira? Um, well, we do have one of our journal's experimental results, which is looking at publishing sort of short papers focused on a specific result, and they've employed a new system where they have sort of subject specialists to review the general content of the paper in, in that particular subject area. But then also if the subject specialist flags it for a statistical review of the data, then we have a group of full statistical reviewers who go and check the data separately. So I think that sort of fits into what I was saying earlier about trying to thread the burden around a bit. So sort of a mix between mm -hmm. having the specialist, uh, specialists in the field look at that aspect of the paper, having the statistical analysts look at the statistics side of the paper, um, and yeah, perhaps even if someone's deposited the code in a repository that does some minimum correct curation even before all of that, then that again helps split the workload. And I think that's probably a more feasible and sustainable solution than trying to have one part of the process entirely responsible for data review. Yeah, so a mixed model kind of method. Right, brilliant, I, think, I guess Bea, you can probably stop sharing the slide now. Stephen, do you have any final comments that you'd like to, to share with us? Um, well, first of all, just to thank you for today and the, the whole week. I think these conversations are incredibly important and we need to talk more and often across the whole ecosystem about how this can be tackled. I think if, we, if, if I as a researcher think about what the best model is, I think I see a very narrow set of responses and I've learned quite a bit today about hearing it from different perspectives particularly Kira's perspective has been very insightful so I think we need to be doing more of this as a community to try and understand the challenges that we have this is this is a no-brain no, sorry I think most people would agree it needs to be done but how it's done without just putting the burden onto a small number of people I think uh, needs to be thought about very carefully that's great. Thank you, Stephen. They're really great thoughts to end on. Um, and, I, and I think you're right, you're right, getting all these kind of different stakeholders together, researchers, publishers, funders, the, the support staff together to talk about these issues is, is really key and important. So I'd like to just end by saying a huge thank you to Cambridge University Libraries for putting on this webinar today, for Bea for being my co-pilot, a big thank you to Kira and Stephen uh, for joining me on the panel today. Huge thank you to our audience. Um, we will be hopefully writing up a blog post uh, after today's talk, so if you're interested in, in reading a bit more and we'll be answering some of the questions that weren't answered during the session today. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for tuning in and have a great rest of your day. Thanks again for hosting. It's all right. Thanks for joining me.